works perfectly. No demo effect, everything will work perfectly. No, no fear there. So uh, what to expect? Uh, no questions, because uh, unlike the two previous speakers, I have the plane just after, so you'll just send me a, send me a tweet or something after. So uh, why VR doesn't matter? Uh, yes, it's talk about VR. Um, how does it work? Uh, how to design for it? And then what's data visualization more in general? Uh, how in VR it's actually completely different from the usual pie chart you're used to, uh, you love to uh, watch every Monday morning, uh, how to make it, um, and hopefully all the way to the end, how we can actually make one from nothing. Um, so first, what, what's the point of VR? Uh, because yes, it is a new technology. Yes, I do believe it's really exciting, but still, wh what's the point of VR? So it's for all the things you cannot do. It's not for the thing like maybe you should be doing, like maybe doing a bit more to the gym because you had too much uh, yesterday for dinner. It's not for the thing that, oh, maybe, I don't know, if you want to go to uh, the Caribbean that you've never been, or it's really for stuff that's impossible. Like I, I'm a diver, I love diving, uh, but I will never go to the deep end of the Marian trenches. Uh, I like traveling, but maybe I'll go on Mars. Probably not, but I'll never go uh, on, a, on another um, universe. Um, so all those things, or going on a four-dimensional plane, uh, doing like hyperbolic geometry, not just doing it, but being there, this I'll never be able to do. So to me, that's what VR is for. For the stuff that maybe I sh could do one day, or I should do, but stuff that's really impossible. Uh, and yet, it doesn't matter. So the time in VR matters for the time when you live. When you put the headset off, and then if you learn something and you can apply to help friends, yourself, your company, that's what matters. VR in self, who gives a... It doesn't matter. I can swear on it, so it's too late. Um, so what is VR, actually? Um, so it's, it's when you can build a whole world or a whole universe around you and all your friends or colleagues. Uh, it's really the holodeck. That's the, one of the most uh, famous examples for it. Uh, it, you just make everything around you fade away. So just as um, I was going to ask you to stand up, but the chairs are moving, so if I start to do this, then half of you will fall after. Um, show of hands, how many have tried at least a cardboard? Okay, most of you. How many have tried the um, HTC Vive with the controller? Okay, about a third. Um, that's good. If you haven't tried, you should, you must. How does it work? So uh, it's, I thought I would do um, a little bit of magic, but then I'm not good at it, so I'll skip that part. But it really works the same way. If you start to do close-up magic, uh, it doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter if you studied uh, how the brain works. It doesn't matter if you study even like what a card is. If somebody is really good at magic, does a close-up, then stuff just appears in front of you out of nowhere. So it, it's just based on how, no matter how smart you are, your brain is actually doing shortcuts, making heuristic. So if you just put two screens in front of your eyes, if you have a camera with a little offset from the left and the right eye, and then you change the image just based on the orientation of your head, that's it. That's just how this little magical effect happens. And it doesn't matter again. You can know the entire physics behind it. It still works. The problem also is for those who haven't tried it, I'm sorry, it's a little bit of a wasted talk. Um, if you haven't tried VR, it, it, again, it doesn't matter how smart you are. If you haven't put the headset, you won't get it. Uh, so it's a little bit like pizza. If you've never tried pizza, I love pizza. Little, it's it's uh, sweet, savory, it's a bit spicy and everything. But if I have a friend who's never ever tried pizza, my love for pizza, I will never be able to translate and transfer to that person. So that's a little bit the problem I have with VR. For those of you who haven't tried it, it doesn't matter how passionate I am, it doesn't matter how pedagogical or clear I hope to be, you won't get it. So I, I didn't annoy the organizer with this, but ideally for the next one, everybody in the room will have the headset and then we'll do we'll try it like this at least for a few minutes, but not this time. Next one. So how does it actually work in practice? So um, it's pretty simple. You just have a little infrared projector. It sends a beam first at the beginning of uh, your, let's say, session to say, hey, that's when time starts. Then you have little 
uh, higher receptors everywhere around. And then it's like, oh, I received the signal. And that took about a few milliseconds. So I'm pretty far away. I receive another signal, much closer, so I'm much closer in distance. And I receive one horizontally and one vertically. So it's the same for the headset. And by receiving it also on two different ones, then I know not just where I am in space, but what's my orientation. So pretty basic and pretty fast, and it does scale. And same for the controller. When I say does scale, you can have several of those. And it's sub-millimeter precision. So that's consumer grade, so it costs about 800 euros. Uh, you can juggle with it. I will not do it, because I'm not a juggler, so that might end up being too funny for this. Uh, but it's pretty precise. Um, it also makes um, pretty uh, significant differences that now, when you build for VR, you don't build for somebody who is behind a screen and just a brain of that close to you. are on your chair, you just don't move your whole body. When you're uh, designing for VR, you design for somebody who will actually move in space. Arms, legs, maybe even jump around, maybe start to run, uh, crouches. So it's, it's a completely different kind of UX or design experiment. Uh, and yes, uh, VR is not, it just started. Uh, it's basically, so that's, that's the phone today. That was a smartphone uh, a few years ago. So that's VR today. Huh? We're not there yet, we're getting there, but we're far from it. So yeah, you, it's a bit still, um, so you need to think about it when you design. You don't design for Iron Man. You design for somebody who is, if you dive again, uh, if you have like a dry suit, you're basically, yeah, you, you, f you don't feel as good. It will change, but for now it's better to keep that in mind. Uh, and then you have to rethink space and how to organize space. Because again, uh, if you put elements uh, really high up, then after a few minutes, just the neck starts to feel painful. So you need to uh, have all those into account, which gives some pretty basic uh, design rules. Uh, and yes, this why VR reappeared a few years ago is because we had huge progress uh, in sensors and in screens, just again, thanks to mobile and uh, the automotive industry. But it's not just about the visuals, it's also about all the sounds. So if you can have sound all around you coming for different sensors, you, you were much more immersed. And the controllers, because again, the input and having them uh, really... Then when you do build again, uh, you need to think a bit, it's the usual, um, the more expensive it is, the less people will have it. So you need to think about the curve of adoption and then, well, the more possibility it is, the more expensive, the less people will have it. So depends for whom you want to build. Uh, and mill new constraints. So um, some of the things that you learn from, let's say, designing for the web, where um, some you make a, a website at Google and it works from this to three screens to a huge um, video projector. So you need to design for all those. And you also you design for a completely different hardware because the graphic card on this, and the graphic card on this or that machine are completely different. So you need to have all your assets scaling with this performance. So the foundation is a uh, basic rule for designing for VR. If you haven't tried it, not just VR, but your concept, you're wrong. Doesn't matter again how smart you are. You just can't imagine it. You need to have your crazy idea, start to sketch it, how to do anything with it, put it on, and then you can start to evaluate, but you can't project it. Uh, it's all work in progress. We're learning. It's pretty new field still. It's been re-founded. Uh, and yes, it's not perfect medium. There are things that really make no sense in VR. You don't need to do everything in it. Um, some basic rules is uh, are that you don't uh, change the camera rotation. It's as if, for example, uh, if I change the camera, so where the person is looking, it's as if somebody was grabbing my head and moving it like this. Not that fun, not that pleasant. So you can move the whole person around, but don't change the rotation. And if you do, keep it smooth. Um, know the minimum amount of interaction. Maybe somebody will not have all those fancy controllers. And know how the body works. Um, Ideally, because you immerse somebody in an entire new world, then you want to provide feedback for everything the person is doing. He or she is pressing on button, he or she is looking at any kind of shape, then how does it react? Does it make a sound? Does it glow? Does it some you need constant feedback because you don't have all those senses yet. Um, 
And yes, if any of you is doing uh, 3D graphics, if you can do photorealism in real time, come speak to me after. Uh, I challenge anybody to do that. Uh, for me, the state of the art for 3D graphics is Pixar. Uh, they don't do this. They release some uh, VR short or a little game few days or weeks ago, and it does look cartoonish. It does look like a video game. So if those guys don't do it, uh, but again, come prove me wrong after. I'll be happy to, uh, to discover something. Um, so I do it. Uh, I do VR uh, as a Mozilla contributor also. So I have the startup and I have uh, freelancing, but I also do it as a Mozilla contributor. What's the point is that once you have this holodeck, this whole universe that you can build for you or others, well, you don't want artificial limitations. Yes, physical limitation, hardware limitation, because the hardware is not there yet, fair enough. But then if I want to build a world and I have limitation, that's really frustrating and infuriating for me. So by doing it open source and, well, maybe, well, you might know the guy in the t-shirt, maybe it, it can let you explore a bit more. So I do it as a Mozilla contributor, doing pull request issues, going to events left and right, and mostly discussing on Slack for newcomers. And yes, I, I travel a bit for it, do workshops, because I think it's weird. I think it's, you should be, not, not necessarily worried, but before strapping this on your head, you should learn a little bit how it works. Yes, hopefully to build for it and then to make something different, but yeah, learn the basic of how it does work. So doing workshop for that for anybody uh, and presentation and talks. So. And, uh, and little demos. So uh, I think one of the best ways uh, to learn about the new medium or anything is you build something. Uh, so silly ones, uh, like I was in, uh, in my um, office, and then uh, I'm not, as you can probably see, I'm not that good at soccer. Um, so I'm strapped on my feet. So I have the two controllers to grab the ball. Uh, and I put on uh, my feet using uh, plastic wrap from the kitchen, two other controllers to kick the ball. Uh, that's a 3D model of myself, I scan myself, and I managed to lose again myself. So it's a pretty silly demo, but uh, it was the first, as far as I know, where you had, let's say, full body immersion, not just the hand, but also uh, the feet and on the web. Uh, silly demo, though, but it's uh, really as a building block for me and for others to learn how it works, because again, it's a new medium, it has to be challenged, so by sharing demos, you can help other children and yourself also to be challenged when those are criticized because they're not perfect. Um, then when you've done something, you want to share it. I'm pretty happy about it. Like the first thing I want to do, I've done something I want to share with people around me. The problem is it can be a little bit tricky. So one of the best medium to share, keep on moving this one around, uh, is using the web. Um, I don't know, do you know how many people, uh, how many apps people install on average per month? Any number? About zero. That's about how many apps people install per month. Yes, Facebook, WhatsApp, all that, it's because it's already bundled on the phone. It's a good strategical agreement with something and others. But on average, zero app. Clicking on the link, anybody click on you. Even a stranger give you a link, you'll open it. So delivery mechanism, once you do have, when you spend all that time doing amazing VR content, or even not amazing yet at the beginning, you want to share it. And the web for that is the best diffusion platform. So you can do VR on the web. And it's not just like putting native on the web. It's actually, um, you can do more. Uh, yes, you can do also, you can work offline. You can do progressive web apps and then even your page can be offline uh, and have an icon and whatever you want it to have. But you also, you can, uh, if you're epileptic, close your eyes now. Uh, you can move from one uh, virtual board to the next. So if you make a world, and then somebody else in the room make one, you can just dive from one to the next without removing the headset, but also without going back, let's say, to a store like the uh, Oculus Store or Steam. So that's not possible without the web. And it supports all the, from the most basic controllers to the fancy one, to the latest that were released a few weeks ago by, uh, I think, Microsoft, the newer ones. And it also makes new opportunities because, yes, not not among those of you who did raise your hand about trying VR, maybe I would say 10% of those do have a headset, most don't. So if you can have content that is really responsive and it works from the highest end to the lowest end, then you can reach pretty much anybody and everybody. Uh, and it's pretty fast to do. You don't have to uh, spend too much time. So um, I'll show you that directly. 
So because maybe not all of you are programmers, so this is all in 3D, all in VR. And I'll do the little painting demo. Uh, so like I said, it's all on the web. Does it work? Oh, yeah, tired. Yay. Okay. I just don't know how it will work with the... We try, okay. Ah, I'm on the floor. Ah, well, that will, I'll still do it like this. So the point is that um, if any of you have tried uh, to paint with Blender or uh, Maya or doing 3D modeling, just can't do it. So uh, up. I'll try not to hit myself. As you can also appreciate, I'm not an artist. And yes, it's all it's all in 3D. So, uh, and I can save it. Up. Up. And it, then it generates a link that, um, if you have extremely good eyes, if you open this link on your phone, uh, you will have the same content that then you can keep all being the account. So, um, it does. It's loading still. Ah, yes, yeah, there. It's really hard to see, but um. Uh, so, I just put the headset. Uh, why do I insist on this? For two things. Because if again, if any of you have tried to do s even an ugly thing like this on any 3D modeling software, if you're not an expert, like a proper modeler, that will take you hours, and then you will still be like pretty unhappy about it. And I just do this. I just do this movement because my body knows it. I don't have to think like about axis, projection, how to change the orientation, how to align everything. I just do it. Just, just my hand does it. I don't have to think through. So why do I insist also so much on this? I just copy and paste the link. If you open it, again, I don't recommend you start to type it, but uh, then you can start to paint also on top of it. So then I can start to have a collaboration process. So it's an ugly, non-functional prototype but in seconds, I already have something going. How much uh, time do I have? Because I, huh? I mean, it's okay. So I had to do all this <laughs> before talking about the visualization, especially since about a, a third of you didn't even haven't even tried VR yet. Do take the time to try. Because you really you can't even imagine what it is. And try if you can with a proper headset with the controllers. So a data visualization. Um, so the process, I'll skip that because it's a little bit too long, but basically you want to gain some insight. If you already know what the graph will tell you, then just like a confirmation bias, ba um, confirmation bias, there is really no point. You want to look at data and then you want to learn something out of it. If you're not surprised, it's really pointless. So you need to generate some insight out of it. Uh, it's still a pretty young field. Do any of you know who, what that graph is? When that, okay, it's from the mid eight. It's the first um, pie chart. It's from uh, 1951, I think. But it's still, it's, it sounds old, but it's not that old. So we're, we're basically learning still what the visualization is. And so it's a new challenge for the whole field. Um, yes, now we have basic rules uh, on how to do it, which is basically amount of uh, pixel or ink per uh, data ratio, or I would even say insight. If it's like super cool looking, but then you don't learn from it, then you basically, it's, it's, it's a visual. It's not a data visualization. The problem is that was a really convenient heuristic for traditional data visualization for VR. I'll challenge that a bit. Uh, the problem also is like, if you see weird uh, VR data visualization, you say, okay, what's the point? It's because you've been trained at school. Uh, to learn how those graphs work. The first time you see a graph like this, it's still pretty abstract. You don't usually get it. 
Uh, so there is a bit of a curse of knowledge there that because you already know this, then it becomes self-evident, but it isn't. And then yes, the usual thing is, okay, we just have more complex data set, we just add more dimension, this way we get a bit more perspective. Uh, and the problem <laughs> that goes with that is, oh, we'll do it in VR, because then we can do 3D so easily, as I, I showed before, so convenient, so yeah, we'll just like add that dimension and then we'll have it. Uh, that works, but it's a little bit missing the point, and worse than that, uh, I think it's pretty dangerous because, um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, because I think really the price will change. It's, it is still pretty expensive. Uh, yes, the screens, you can see the pixel. <laughs> That's how uh, far back we are in time. Uh, and yes, you can do it together, uh, alone. So you can also do it together. I did the same kind of prototyping with a colleague of mine in Vietnam, and we both synchronized, so it's not, and it's, it doesn't have to be an isolative process. The problem is really that we're not that creative. Uh, yeah, we want to do a pie chart in 3D and then in VR. Uh, we've done that before. That how do you expect to get an insight out of this? So we need to think a bit out of the box and think of new ways. That's me. Doesn't help. So yes, the, it means being a little bit less lazy, not just going one dimension up and putting a pie chart in front of you. Uh, so one thing that a little bit less uh, is that you have uh, to, to generate a to change the perspective and generate it so you don't have a pie chart in front of you but then you have a flow you have your old model and your equation and then you can scale it up and down then you can step in that so you can already be in the data and then modify your equations live to see how they are it's a little bit better uh, and then you can okay if three dimensions is not enough then you can do a hypercube then you can dive through that's a machine learning example on how to analyze uh, the result of the analysis of a data set uh, from CERN. Um, but really, the way to do it, uh, I believe at least uh, correctly, is to make it personal. Um, y if you somehow can connect to the data set, no matter how abstract it is at first, then it, you, you feel there and then it is somehow building something. Uh, so that's an example from the Wall Street Journal where it's using uh, data from the um, before the financial crisis, and then you have it as a roller coaster. So instead of just having this uh, line where you just see uh, like um, uh, a time series, then you ride the time series. You start to feel when you have a dip, you feel it pretty much in your gut. So uh, that's a completely uh, new way to experience data, and then you will remember it days, weeks, or months after. If it's just a curve, it's much harder to do that. Um, the problem is, uh, yeah, I will... Do, do, how many of you know Flatland uh, from Carl Sagan? It's, it's trying to explain what's the third, fourth, there's one guy, fifth dimension and nth dimension after. It's basically, it's if you try to explain... Um, if it, I won't have time to play the video, I really recommend you do watch it. But uh, if you try to explain to imagine a little uh, world populated with squares uh, and uh, circles and everything, and then you have a sphere in three dimensions that come on top of it and say hi, it, the, the little sphere, um, the little square rather, will not compute. It won't, he or she won't get it uh, because it's just from another plane, another dimension. So um, that's the problem with <laughs> sharing VR if you haven't tried it. You need to try it. Um, and then when you see things like this, when you have, that's, at the, um, I don't know if I have some. Um, that's from the uh, Canada's Energy Demand. Uh, it's a pretty cool looking one. So the problem is you assume that, uh, I'll try that, yeah. Uh, lots of interaction. You can also visualization for the map, then everything can be floatable. And uh, really you can pull those data back and forth. So it works pretty well. And when you see this, you're, you get pretty excited by it. You say, okay. And, um, and it's pretty amazing until, um, until this. So OC4 is the Oculus Conference, pretty much the uh, reference in the field that was a few um, weeks ago when uh, Medium, which is another uh, 3D or rapid prototyping tool, 
uh, the team was explaining how they used data visualization to show which of the different uh, edges of the model were wrongly computed. And the guy is explaining it, he's showcasing the tool, and um, just like I was before in VR to the audience, and then he was like, hey, that's pretty obvious. Don't, like, I see that here uh, those uh, vertices are wrongly uh, computed, the angle is wrong. They're like, oh, yeah, it's pretty obvious in VR, I guess. And then the whole audience is like, okay, we're not in VR, we don't get it. So the second uh, layer of abstraction behind this is to showcase a tool in VR on a flat screen is pretty tricky. So that's why I say the next one, the next time we do a talk like this, you will have to have the headset. I won't. I'll see about the organization about that, but uh, that's how it started to make sense, not using projections of projections. Um, and yes, like I said, it doesn't have to be, there are a lot of critics about, oh yes, VR, then you're all alone in there. It doesn't have to be. Like I said, I've done, I've worked with like this before. You just like have Skype on or you have this uh, audio stream and then you start to build together. You point, you see the other person where like you have shared attention. You see he or she is looking in that direction. I know he's paying attention there, moving around. Uh, pointing with the hands, and then you can build on the same object, or you can share the same data set. Um, this I'll skip also. Uh, so how to do it properly? Uh, so if you just go from Excel and you select your data and you d generate a pie chart, even a 3D one, you will never get this kind of uh, immersion, this feeling of uh, being somewhere else. Uh, so a discussion I had yesterday evening is like, how long do you need to do Minecraft in VR? Uh, I would say if you've never done it, but you have some basic notion of programming, about an hour. It's just like a 3D uh, matrix and then different kind of uh, element based on texture and behavior. So to do a mapping from your data set to some 3D world is actually very easy. Uh, because yeah, you, you just have this kind of data already, so you can map it, and then you will see, for example, your indicator, instead of being a red column for this, then you will have lava or whatever. It sounds a bit silly because it sounds like a game and we're serious people, but if you can feel something like this, and if you can start to run around and say, oh, this is a bad area, you feel that it's a bad area, then you will build on this. Then you will be able to know, okay, we actually have a problem in this area of our business or research. Um, the problem is that you need to change your team. You can't just like have a 3D modeler or a data analyst, which is already not always the case, uh, but you need an architect eventually because you're building a world. So you need to say, hey, how does a building, how does this visualization feel like when I'm in it? Maybe you need also an urbanist because you don't have just one building, but you scale up from several or a set of data vis visualization. So you need to have those skills that are usually not there. Uh, but that's the kind of mindset those people have. How do I feel good within a space? And even if you're a little bit funky, uh, you can also have a, a yoga teacher because really you start to stretch uh, a bit all this data. And yeah, it's a bit silly now. I hear some of you laughing, but uh, as it does progress and we spend more time in it, it might start to make sense. Up to it's fun. Uh, and uh, the little problem is the more interactive it is, the more interesting it becomes, but then the limit between when it's a data virtualization and when it's actually a tool, because you can actually change and modify it and project or even in real time apply from the insight you've gained, then it, the limit is pretty blurry. So that's a little example from um, uh, KubeCon when you have uh, Kubernetes uh, um, set of machines that are uh, managed, so just, just displayed, but you have your virtual machine and you can just like, okay, I scale the size of my cluster, I want more containers, I want to change the diabetes. Um, yes, some of the, the good and the bad of it is, uh, the bad is we don't really know still how it works, uh, how to do a proper data visualization for it. Uh, but if you do think like an architect, if you think about the space, how to fill in it, based on your data set, then you're getting somewhere. And making it personal and relatable. So this one is, um, especially if, I mean, if you use data virtu the, um, visualization, it's either for you to get insight, also to provide insight to somebody else you're speaking with. Uh, so you need for them to make it, when I say personal, it doesn't have to be a uh, strong personal emotion of uh, falling in love or something like this, but it can be, hey, we have again a problem in that specific uh, business unit. So they have to be able to relate to it. 
Uh, and some of that is really, really easy. For example, to uh, that, that some of the stuff that sounds super complicated, if you have like a data set, if you get your brain scan, uh, to be able to, or any kind of actually body part, to display it and then to be able to grab it, scale it up and down, turn it around, move it around to really see how it is. That's, it comes for free, basically. You have toolkits for this to do it uh, instantaneously. Uh, and yes, to, to manipulate uh, your whole infrastructure, being Amazon or whatnot, you have a whole library for this. So to bind that library to the display of the machines you have and act on it, basically comes for free. Uh, how long do I have now? It's okay. Uh, well, I won't look silly in public, at least that's the good part of it. Um, it's, yeah. Have. Well, I still do uh, just a bit. What's still to come? Uh, better, cheaper hardware. Doesn't matter that you see the pixel. Doesn't matter that it's a little bit clunky, that it's not super stylish. Uh, phone a few years ago, phone today. It's, it's really a detail. Uh, what's more to come? That we're still uh, building the grammar of data virtualization, that uh, we're getting used also to it. Like I said, it, it's a learning process, both to consume those, but also to build them. Uh, more of it on the web, and because also um, um, machine learning and AI is a pretty interesting topic, it is not exclusive. Like I showed also before, the CERN data visualization uh, was a tool done in, um, in VR, and I'm also giving a workshop in Brussels in a few days about how to bring uh, VR and machine learning together, so how you do like shape recognition, uh, OCO, all these kind of things. I tried, I failed, so that's why I'm bringing friends who actually know more uh, on the topic. And yes, a bunch of resources. And as the very last slide, just the link. So tinyurl.com slash Kodiaks, where you have all those slides. So you can find all those resources and contact me when you have questions. It's I got to go. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That was very bold and a lot of content. <laughs> <laughs>